right, so of course you know that I can't ignore a Blue Note announcement. This time it's the release schedule for the classic vinyl reissue series. This happens, it feels like, every March, and, uh, and so here we are. So for those who don't know, the classic vinyl series is the continuation of the 80th anniversary series of vinyl reissues from several years ago. Uh, and in fact, aren't we technically at 85th anniversary? But they're not rebranding it, they're just calling it classic vinyl. Um, and more specifically, this series includes reissues of mostly what I'll call classic era albums from like 1956-ish through about 1970, I don't know, like 1975 or something like that. Um, but also some modern reissues, and they're all presented in a way that isn't quite the tone poet treatment, um, but still all analog. It's still mastered by Kevin Gray, still 180 gram. These ones happen to be manufactured at Optimal. Um, they're in standard packaging and they're not in a gatefold. Um, and they're also not, re uh, what is it, like supervised by Joe Harley. But let's also be real, um, these are more affordable too. They are selling for $27.98. And for those of you who um, follow either Amazon or me on Instagram, you know that, uh, that sometimes these things are discounted well after the fact, like well after the fact. And so if you wanna, you still have to pay full price if you want them, well, like say within the first year of release or so, or, or first like six months of release. But, but generally speaking, it seems like they, uh, they seem to ease back on the price after a period of time as well. So um, as I've said many times before, we're gonna go through this title by title, and there are 16 of them. I think it's like something like 12 of them I have original copies of to show you, but I'm gonna give you my thoughts of every single title and conclude with what my top grabs are in terms of the entire series. So without further ado, um, click like, and even if you don't do that, click subscribe. So. When you click like, YouTube's algorithm prioritizes my video in their recommendations for other people who aren't even aware of my channel. Um, it's, the, it's actually the single biggest thing that you can do to help me compete with the big guys uh, like Noble Records and Mazzy and Ken McAuliffe and, and all the other like big time channels that have lots of followers. We're still small time here, um, but we're trying. So, uh, so do those things, click like and subscribe. And if you're already on Instagram, of course, uh, you can follow me too as well. That would be cool. Uh, my Instagram handle is what underscore can underscore brown. All right, so let's talk about this series at a high level. So as I said, there's 16 titles. They're spaced at two per month from May of this year through December of this year. And what you'll see is actually that the two that are paired together are usually, but not always close together in terms of their original release date, but they always have something in common. Um, it just so happens that they're doing very different things. So I actually really like this approach where you get sort of two perspectives on music from the same time period. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of, uh, I'll try to speak to that, I guess, as it, uh, as it comes up in the schedule. So let's start with the two titles for May. So the first one that's coming out, and this is on May 17th. In fact, each of the titles for that month are coming out the same, the same day. Uh, so the, the first one that's coming out on May 17th is Stanley Turrentine with the three sounds, and this is Blue Hour. Um, so this is an original pressing, it happens to be mono, and actually I don't know whether they're doing mono or stereo. Both are appropriate, both are original for the time period. My guess would be that they would choose the, uh, the stereo edition, which I have not had the opportunity to hear. I've only owned this mono um, for, for actually quite a while. So on this record you have, well, Stanley Turrentine and the Three Sounds, as the album cover uh, suggests. And that lineup is, uh, I think has been fairly consistent over the years. So Gene Harris, Andrew Simpkins, and Bill Dowdy are the, uh, are the Three Sounds trio, and they put out a number of titles under their own sort of banner, starting with catalog number 1600, which is the only title that came after 15, the 1500 series and before the 4000 series. It was like almost like they were gonna start a 1600 series and they didn't. It was just that album and then they uh, they abandoned it and, and they went with, um, with the 4000 series. So um, I'm actually a huge fan of this album. In the past, I think on Instagram, I put together a list of my favorite Three Sounds records and inevitably the ones with Stanley Turner and Lou Donaldson, one or the other, uh, as the uh, sort of saxophone voice, 
were the ones that uh, that elevated to the top. But this is like this is either my favorite or my second favorite of the of the albums that the three sounds are on. So I'm a, I think this is a fantastic idea to include this. Also, like, I, I'm sorry, this just came to mind, but really amazing cover. So this is actually the Rudy Van Gelder studio. This would be the Bergenfield studio. So you kind of get a sense of, um, of perhaps what it would have been uh, looking like, I guess, to, uh, to record with these kind of silhouettes in that space, which I, I just think is really cool. So um, for those folks who aren't familiar with this record, I would recommend starting with, like previewing G Baby Ain't I Good To You. So this is not an original, obviously. This is like a standard at this point, but, um, but just really phenomenal music overall. And I think that one, that one is particularly great because I think what Stanley Turrentine reminds me of is like a Ben Webster or like a Coleman Hawkins kind of doing this like breathy sort of saxophone solo over the piano trio that I just think works really, really well. All right, so the second one that's coming out on May 17th, this is just another really, really strong one. They, these guys are, the Blue Notes starting with two just amazingly strong albums. So the next one is Workout by Hank Mobley. Um, this is, it's a phenomenal lineup. It's Grant Green, Wynton Kelly, Paul Chambers, and Philly Joe Jones. So you have a little bit of a sort of Miles Davis thing going on there with Wynton Kelly, Paul Chambers, and Philly Joe Jones, depending on the era, I suppose. But um, in any event, uh, this is this is just phenomenal music. So at the same time that uh, Blue Hour came out in 1961, this one came out in 1962. So I mentioned that in every month, the two releases are actually somewhat connected in terms of their time period, but a little bit different styles. And so I think if, uh, if Blue Hour was a little bit more of a soul jazz, almost like origins of soul jazz type of uh, sound, this is very much hard bop. And, and obviously with these uh, with with the um, the addition of uh, Grant Green, you're going to get a different element with uh, with Hank Mobley's saxophone. So if I were to recommend, I mean, I'd kind of recommend everything on this album. I think that the title track, which is pretty fast paced, it's also like a full ten minutes, is really really good. Lots of solos, just phenomenal. The other fast paced one is Smokin', which would make sense um, given the uh, given the title. And the balance of the, uh, there's only five tracks total, but the balance, the other three are actually a little bit slower. So like you have Workout and Smokin', which are these fast paced uh, things that kind of accentuate Mobley's ability to be sort of somewhat aggressive on the tenor. And the other ones are a little bit more of his melodic uh, sort of sensibility. And, and all, are, all are equally rewarding, all are amazing. And um, I personally think that that this is like one of the strongest in the entire, probably in the, in the entire calendar for me. All right, so the next two that are coming out on, when are they coming out? They're coming out on June 21st. So at the same time that the previous two albums that I discussed for May have a little bit something in common in terms of when they were released, these next two for June actually have more in common because they are both led by a piano player and they're both contemporary jazz. And so and what I mean by that is put out in the 2000s as well as contemporary in style. So the first one is by Aaron Parks, the pianist, and uh, the title is Invisible Cinema. Um, so the lineup on here actually kind of varies. So you have uh, Matt, let's see, Penman on uh, bass, you have Eric Harland on drums, and then periodically you have Mike Moreno on guitar. And I'm trying to see if there's any other musicians and I'm not seeing them, but basically you, sometimes you have a duet, a trio, and then sometimes a quartet kind of format. Um, so Aaron Parks, I don't know to what extent folks are necessarily familiar with Aaron Parks, a uh, phenomenal pianist. Um, I, I would The reason why I kind of almost hesitate to say that is just that I know a lot of folks focus on, um, on earlier releases, right, on the vintage stuff, but, but know too that there are so many amazing musicians who are putting out great new music today. Um, and, uh, and Aaron Parks, yeah, so 2008 is when this album came out. So get this, Aaron Parks is actually younger than I am by a couple of years. And that was, um, that's kind of interesting because, um, well, it just, uh, it humbles me a little bit. Um, so this album is, uh, is fantastic. I would say that if I were to recommend a track, it would be Travelers. And at the same time that folks who follow my channel and know what I think about um, maybe some of the prior Blue Note calendars specific to contemporary releases, and sometimes I'm a little meh on the reissues, 
this this is a phenomenal album. I think folks should really pay attention to this release. Um, I, I I was aware of this album. I don't own a copy, which is why I have to uh, to show you a uh, sort of a screenshot here. But I'm excited for it to be on vinyl, possibly for the first time. Is this on vinyl for the first time? I think it is. So that's something to celebrate uh, right there. Yeah, I think it's on vinyl for the first time. So this is one of those situations where you know, yes, it's contemporary, and yes, it is a reissue of something that came out in 08, but this may be the opportunity for me to finally get a vinyl copy. All right, so the second one that's coming out on the very same date, June 21st, um, this one is by Jason Moran, and this is titled simply 10. So this was put out in 2010. I don't know if that was the uh, necessarily the reference, but um, this is, I would say, a you know mostly a trio. There are a couple of uh, vocalists added for track 13, but you have Jason Moran with Taurus Mateen and Nashit Waits, I believe, on uh, bass and drums. Uh, so this is another one that I just think is, um, is phenomenal music. And I actually don't know if this has been released only on CD in the past, but again, it came out in 2010. It really is, um, it really is phenomenal. And if I were to describe this versus the other one, I would say versus uh, the one that we just discussed, I'd say that one is a little bit more post-bop and a little bit more traditional in feel. And this one is a little bit more contemporary in, uh, in feel and maybe even more, um, not avant-garde, but like it's more improvisation and it's a little bit more just kind of interesting and like introspective is what I would say about uh, about this album. But this is another one that I think is uh, is very worthwhile and it's kind of curious that uh, that they're including it. Every time that they include a, uh, a contemporary album in the Blue Note classic series, it kind of takes me by surprise. And typically they're ones that I haven't heard before. This is one that I hadn't heard before. And I previewed some tracks and I thought, wow, this actually sounds really good and I'm really excited to hear what it's gonna sound like on vinyl. All right, next up, July 19th, there are two more titles, again, closely connected. So you have the magnificent Thad Jones. This is an original pressing. This is not in great shape. The cover's not in great shape and the vinyl's not in great shape, but it's great music, suffice it to say. Um, so who we have on this is Billy Mitchell on tenor sax, kind of an early appearance for him. Barry Harris, also an early appearance on a piano, Percy Heath, and then Max Roach. This is a fantastic, fantastic lineup. What I would say about this album is that every track is great and the thing to pay attention to is a separation of instruments. So this is a mono recording. I don't think there's any way that they could release it in any other format other than mono because it was not originally recorded in mono to my knowledge. And, um, and again, what you should pay attention to is the separation of instruments because even though there are two horns, what you'll hear across these tracks is that Thad and Billy Mitchell are kind of featured like separately. There's not as much layered melodies and um, and even when they are playing and they are soloing it's not against the full rhythm section and so there's just lots of opportunity to hear like space around the uh, the notes kind of thing and so I think that this is a I think this is a fantastic uh, addition to the uh, to the lineup or to the uh, release calendar so the other one that's coming out in July is Cliff Craft by Cliff Jordan. So what you'll see is that this is a Music Matters edition because I don't own an original pressing. That probably, I don't wanna say that goes without saying because I have some nice original pressings, but this is just an especially hard one to find. And at some point I decided to pick up the, what is this? Is this a double 45? It probably, yeah, double 45 um, RPM. Yes, it is. <laughs> I uh, had, uh, had to remind myself. So who we have in the lineup here is Art Farmer on trumpet, and Art Farmer plays kind of a mix of uh, muted and unmuted trumpet. Um, you've got Sonny Clark on piano, George Tucker on bass, and Lewis Hayes on drums. And for me, the title track is the best one because I think it highlights Clifford Jordan the best. But overall, I mean, this is just a phenomenal album. I know there's a lot of energy for Clifford Jordan out there um, simply because... Well, okay, not only was he, was, was he amazing, but people have more attention for saxophonists and especially saxophonists who didn't record as many albums as a leader. And so for, there's a variety of reasons why, um, why this is gonna be a pretty desirable one, but well worth it, super happy it's being included in the, uh, in the schedule. All right, so the July titles were 1956 and 1957. Um, guess what, August is 1964 and 1965, well, kind of. So let's talk about that. So the first one is Wayne Shorter's Juju. This was put out in 1964. 
this is an absolutely classic album. There's a lot of energy around this thing, um, and it's extremely hard to find an original copy of, which is the reason why I had to settle for a copy that's in less than decent shape. But who we have on here are Wayne Shorter, McCoy Tyner, Reggie Workman, and Elvin Jones. And I'm trying to think if, yes, Wayne Shorter composes every single track. And so the star of this thing really is, well, it's Wayne Shorter's compositional ability, his arranging, and certainly his playing. And the fact that he is the lone horn on here makes this a little bit more of a personal album than say when he was recording with the Messengers. So this is a absolutely phenomenal recording. And um, again, this is one that I think that I just know is gonna get a lot of attention attention from folks. Um, so, so super excited that that one is included. So that was put out in 1964. And why I said kind of in terms of um, uh, when one of these was put out, well, the next one is Lee Morgan's The Gigolo. So technically this was recorded in 1965, but it was shelved and not put out until 1968. So um, what I know about this without a lot of clarity, I suppose, is that uh, Lee Morgan put out the Sidewinder in about 1965, or maybe it was 1964 as well. And Blue Note was after hits after that point because Sidewinder was far and away the biggest hit album that they had ever had. And so they shelved a lot of Lee Morgan sessions. And so whenever you see all these like late 60s shelved sessions from Lee Morgan, my opinion is that they were searching for the next Sidewinder, but what they were getting were like headier albums that were not as, that weren't as commercial, right? So like Search for the New Land is a, uh, is a great example. So anyway, um, for whatever reason, because some of that speculation, right, they did put this out finally in 1968. And, uh, and on this album, we have Wayne Shorter with Lee Morgan. We also have Harold Mayburn, Bob Cranshaw, and Billy Higgins. Fantastic, fantastic lineup. Um, as with all of these, well, uh, with all of these vintage ones anyway, recorded uh, by Rudy Van Gelder. And this is just a phenomenal album. And I don't think I can even tell you which like individual track to hear versus another. I mean, the title track, the gigolo is 11 minutes long at open side two, and that's phenomenal. Speedball is another one. Um, there's actually four of these tracks, four of the five are composed by Lee Morgan. So, you know, this is not, this is not like, um, I, I, I suppose a easy commercial follow-up to Sidewinder um, because it's so much of his own material. And, and perhaps that's why they, they decided to inevitably shelve it. All right, so incidentally, and this is this is gonna be like for those of us who are nerdy, what occurred to me as I was putting these away is that Lee Morgan's The Gigolo is the first title, I believe, with a spine that is not white since On the Spur of the Moment by Horace Parlin, which came out like well before. And it's just kind of interesting to see it on the shelves as I was putting them away. In any event, um, the next two up are on September 20th, and these are kind of interesting because they are far apart, in fact, 14 years apart, these two releases, but what unifies them is a couple of things. One is that they are piano trio records, and the other is that they are recorded live. So this first one is Utah Hip, not Jutta. Um, it's Utah Hip, <laughs> and this is at the Hickory House. So this is pretty early, uh, catalog number 1515, and who joins Utah is Peter Ind and Ed Thingpet, Thigpen. Um, interestingly enough, Peter Ind was like on Instagram right up until like just before he died. He died during the pandemic. I don't recall if he died of COVID, but he died during the pandemic. And I just remember there was a situation where he liked one of my posts and I thought it was the most bizarre thing because it reminded me or it occurred to me that he was actually on Instagram. Um, but in any event, uh, this is this is phenomenal music. And I know there's a lot of energy for anything that Utah Hip is on. And so um, I'm super interested to hear how this is going to sound, what I'll say cleaned up. And what I mean by that is not that the original recording is necessarily inferior, but every copy that you're going to find is inferior because it's impossible to find a copy of this that hasn't been played a lot and on bad equipment typically because it's like 1956, right? So um, there's going to be a lot of energy for this and on volume two once they finally release it. So the other one that's also coming out on September 20th is a Three Sounds record. So this is the second Three Sounds record that we have in this series. And those of you who remember some of my prior videos, I've been asking for more Three Sounds in the Blue Note series, whether tone poet or classic. And knowing that there's not, I would say, as many massive fans of Three Sounds, 
It makes sense that it's in the classic series. This is a little bit of an interesting title though. So this was originally recorded in 1970, but guess what? The first time that it was put out was in 1996. So it, it had been shelved. What you'll see in terms of the cover is that it carries a lot of the imagery from another Three Sounds record. Uh, forward that was put out, I want to say in like 64, 65. I'll show you the uh, I'll show you the other one so you can see what the other one looked like. Um, so what is on this record? Um, so you have Gene Harris, you have Henry Franklin on bass, so different lineup, and you also have Carl Burnett, different uh, than than the uh, the other Three Sounds record because this is just a little bit later of a period. And so he kind of Gene Harris kind of changed things out. He was also recording under his own name at this point. 1970 but anyway Carl Burnett on drums and Henry Franklin on bass and um, at the same time that this is a little bit unusual this is a surprise for me I did not think that they would be pulling forward a 1970 session that ended up only getting airtime in 1996 and then deciding to reissue it the interesting thing about this one is um, it's actually not the first time it's ever been put out on vinyl it was put out on vinyl in 96 but what's interesting about it is that I had never heard of this album and I downloaded or not I didn't download I um, previewed some tracks and I was actually blown away at how great it sounds so I kind of get it right like the blue note folks are looking for the stuff that's going to sound really good especially if you're going to pull forward content that maybe was released in the 90s or the 2000s you know it's going to sound good and this is no exception so I'm, I'm kind of interested in what they do with this especially because I've never heard it on vinyl all right, we're already in October and this is a super strong month. So this is October 18th is when these uh, titles come out. And the first one is, that I'm going to talk about is uh, Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers and Night in Tunisia. So um, for those of you who know Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers catalog, you'll know that this is not the only album that is titled A Night in Tunisia, which is super confusing. The other one is, I believe, on Vic. I think it's on Vic, not on RCA Victor, right? It's on Vic. Um, but anyway, this is the uh, this is the Blue Note title, um, originally put out in 1960. And what lineup is on this? Well, Lee Morgan, Wayne Shorter, Bobby Timmons, Jimmy Merritt, and of course Art Blakey. So um, there are just five tracks on this, so the folks have uh, plenty of opportunity to stretch, especially on the title track as well as Sincerely Diana. And that's where I suggest you uh, that you start. Also, phenomenal music. This is one of the titles, though, that by the messengers that I feel like is a little bit more ignored, and it may only be because of the cover. It's certainly not because of the music. It is. Um, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, and and I think the reason why I say that is I think that so many of the messengers covers are just a little bit more dynamic in terms of pictures of Art Blakey, uh, and this one is a little bit more blah, I suppose. So there's not as much focus on it. In fact, this very copy is one of the more recent original blue notes that I've purchased and I didn't have to spend very much on it. Like it was definitely pre-pandemic, but like I don't think I spent, I bought it from a, a shop in Providence. I can't even remember what, which one it was. Maybe I'll, if I remember it, I'll put it, uh, I'll put it down below, but um, cause it was a great shop and I was uh, shocked to be able to get this, uh, get this one. So the second one also on October 18th, which is equally exciting, is Royal Flush by Donald Byrd. So you have Pepper Adams, Herbie Hancock, Butch Warren, and Billy Higgins on this one. Phenomenal lineup. Anytime that Donald Byrd and Pepper Adams come together, it's going to produce magic. Uh, and so, yeah, this is, uh, this is no exception. Um, I can't even, I mean, just play everything on this. I can't even necessarily recommend one or the other. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. And again, if I'm looking across the entire lineup of these 16 titles, this is among the top like couple that I, that I think you should pick up. All right. So I'll be damned if uh, November isn't also a super strong month. So coming out on November 15th, we have a title from 1965 and 1964. So the first one from 1965 is Dexter Gordon's Getting Around. And look at that lineup. Bobby Hutcherson, Barry Harris, Bob Cranshaw and Billy Higgins. This is also just a phenomenal album. And one of the reasons why I really like this is because why do I really like this? Um, I, I think it's because it's Dexter playing predominantly like more sensitively. It's like a lot of like ballads or not necessarily ballads, but like slower stuff. It's more introspective. And I feel like it's Dexter's attempt to get into maybe a little bit of the post-bop thing without really going there because 
I don't know that Dexter Gordon ever really got into post bop, but what he did is he slowed down his playing a little bit more and he lingered a little bit more. And it was just, he, there's like more of an introspective sound. And I think it's because of Bobby Hutcherson and because of Billy Higgins and kind of um, adding this kind of texture. And, um, and it's just, uh, it's just absolutely phenomenal. Also, this is one that, um, cause Dexter Gordon was recording out of Paris and I actually think he came back to the U S to actually do this at Rudy Van Gelder's studio, right? Because there was a couple of, a uh, couple of titles where he, um, where it was like Paris tapes or something. And so it just kind of had like a different sound, I think, um, than some of the other, uh, some of the other blue note titles. So, so that's, that's one, the, the other one, like my God, like the fact that Juju and this title, Wahoo, are included in this series, I think just makes the entire series. It's, it's so exciting. Wahoo has been one of the most difficult albums to track down if anybody wanted a vintage copy. Um, and so this is really exciting. So Duke Pearson, who was the A&R man, he was producing a lot of sessions at the time and he did have his own and his own albums were, uh, were phenomenal. So, um, all right, so this is 1964. So you have Donald Byrd, James Spaulding, Joe Henderson, obviously Duke Pearson, you have Bob Cranshaw and Mickey Roker. That lineup is phenomenal. Yes, there's three horns, um, and and it's and it's phenomenal. <laughs> um, so what I would say about this is something that Duke Pearson had a talent for is in his compositions. There's something about them that are just so quintessentially 1960s blue note. Like when you hear them, you don't even have to know who compose like or who's playing on it. You just know that's a Duke Pearson tune, and you get that here. So he he composed five of the six tracks. The sixth one is, is uh, composed by Donald Byrd. And for me, the highlight of this album and one of the highlights of 1960s Blue Note as a whole is that first track, Amanda. If you put that on, you're probably gonna recognize it and you're probably also gonna think that it's, a, uh, it's amazing, well, because it is. All right, so the last two are on December 13th and they are united because, well, the first one was recorded in 1970, the other one was 1971, but also because these are what I would call the most commercial outings of the entire sort of calendar for 2024. So the first one that I actually embarrassingly don't have a copy of, I really thought I did, and now it like bums me out because now everybody's probably gonna go after an original one if they weren't aware of it. But anyway, it's Lonnie Smith's Drives. So not Lonnie Liston Smith, but Dr. Lonnie Smith, right? So these are two different artists. So um, Lonnie Smith is joined here, and I'm having to read this because I'm just not as familiar with this uh, with this album, but Ronnie Cuber on baritone sax, Joe Dukes on drums, Larry McGee on guitar, Lonnie Smith, of course, on organ, and then Dave Hubbard on uh, on tenor. So again, put out in 1970, this was still recorded by Rudy Van Gelder, and it is definitely more of a commercial sound, as I suggested. It's more of a soul jazz kind of thing. But what I would say is that Lonnie, Dr. Lonnie Smith is such a different organ player than, than so many of the other organ players who were playing for Blue Note. More interesting, more sort of percussive with his playing, doesn't rely on like dense, sort of churchy sort of chords. Um, and, and he also doesn't play necessarily all of the parts that say a, that a Jimmy Smith would in terms of like covering for bass all the time. Um, and so I find that there to be more, more to like in this type of format, plus the fact that we have two saxes. So, you know, there's just going to be more going on, but still very much a soul jazz kind of outing. Um, and the last one that we're going to talk about is a Grant Green record, but a late Grant Green record. So this is Visions. Um, so put out in 1971, and I want to say, gosh, was um, was this the last? I'd have to like double check to see if this is the last studio album that um, that Grant Green put out for Blue Note. It's possible. Checking this live, no, it's definitely no, it's not, because he did the final come down, which is kind of a soundtrack album, and then he did Live at the Lighthouse. So I'm I'm mistaken just by a year. So those other two albums he put out in 1972, then he was out, he moved to Cobblestone, then he like, I think Blue Note ended up releasing something that was previously recorded in any, in any event, and then he was like Kudu and other, other uh, labels. So um, I don't know, I'll, I'll say this, I have not listened to this one as much as other albums by design. This is not my favorite Grant Green record. It is more commercial in sound. It doesn't have as much ability for him to sort of shine in terms of his 
the tone that he's able to achieve on his guitar. But it's still it's still a great album from 1971. So you have Ray Armando on congas, you have Idris Muhammad on drums, you also have Harold Caldwell, uh, Cardwell on uh, drums as well, Chuck Rainey on electric bass, Emmanuel Riggins on electric piano, uh, and then Billy Wooten on vibraphone. Billy Wooten's an interesting uh, inclusion here for me, but in any event, it's interesting to have some of these electrified instruments in addition to obviously the amplified guitar of, uh, of Grant Green. So, you know, yes, this is late period. Yes, it's definitely more commercial in sound, but it's still Grant Green and it still sounds great. And it's really interesting to hear him, I think, in in a context that's not quite as um i don't know it just doesn't have sort of the organic sounds of maybe some of his earlier stuff all right so those were the 16 titles um so what do i think about this release schedule um i think in short that it's fantastic so now don't get me wrong there are always going to be people who say why not this title or that title but typically if you ask multiple people what you'll find out is that they like different titles in the uh, release calendar and they wish different titles were a part of it um, and so there's always going to be these complaints. It's hard to please everybody. I do think that there's something to, uh, to appeal to everyone here, though. And I think that there's a couple of particularly desirable titles that are just that everyone is going to be clamoring for. Um, so, you know, the people who like adventurous titles, um, maybe you're going to wish that there was others included, but at least you get some and then sort of vice versa, the people who like the more straight ahead stuff. Right. So if I were to say what are my favorite uh, titles across this entire lineup? I think you probably got in a sense based on what I've already talked through at this point, but this is what I would say. And there may be more that I like than I don't like. So May is, is particularly strong. Blue Hour by the Three Sounds with Stanley Turrentine is going to be phenomenal. It's going to sound great. Hank Mobley workout. Everyone's gonna wanna pick that one up. I'm actually particularly optimistic for those two modern titles in June because I previewed them and they sound really, really good. And I think this is a good opportunity to kind of reinvigorate some of these titles that a lot of us who got into jazz say after some of these were put out, um, or certainly jazz on vinyl, I think it's a good opportunity to kind of remind yourself that, hey, there was actually some really good stuff that was put out in the, uh, in the 2000s too. So July is really strong with Thad Jones, the magnificent Thad Jones. That one's gonna be fantastic. It's an early recording, um, probably gonna be, it's gotta be in mono, it's gonna be great. Um, Clifford, Clifford Jordan's Cliffcraft is gonna be good as well. August has Wayne Shorter's Juju and Lee Morgan's Gigolo. Both of those are good. Like this is, this is absurd, you know? Uh, Yuta Hip at the Hickory House the following month. Um, Royal Flush probably more so than A Night in Tunisia, at least for me. Uh, and then November, Dexter Gordon's Getting Around and Duke Pearson's Wahoo. I feel like I just basically almost said every single title. So let me see if I can, oh my gosh. If I were to prioritize, this is what I would say. Get Workout, Cliff Craft, Magnificent Thad Jones, Juju, and Wahoo, and Royal Flush. See, I can't even, I can't even do it because they're all great. I, th I legitimately think that all these titles are great. Now, as you've seen, I have a number of them. Am I going to be picking up every title? No, I'm not um, because I like hearing them on the original, in the original form. So I might be a wait for the price to come down kind of person. But I think for those folks who have, who don't own these albums and have been waiting for a decent copy, we all know that Blue Note Classic Series is a great option and they're going to sound great um, because of everybody involved. So... I think this is something to celebrate. I don't even have, I don't have any disappointments. There's nothing that I'm like, oh, why didn't you include this? I think this is a phenomenal list of 16 titles for this year. So hopefully everybody's excited as well. But if you think they missed something, put it in the comments because apparently, I mean, I'm not saying that me talking about the three sounds is what made them, made the Blue Note folks include them in this, <laughs> in this year's calendar because I know nobody over there <laughs> pays attention to me but at the same time it's kind of weird i was talking about the fact that they should include the three sounds and here we are in any event thanks very much i hope this was informative for folks who are maybe not as familiar with some of these titles and i'll see you next time